Hey guys, welcome to our final video for Unit 7. Today we are going to be covering policy making in terms of foreign and military policy. So up until this point, we have focused on domestic policy happening within the United States. Today we are going to be focusing on how the United States handles policy abroad outside of the United States. Um, so a brief overview of US foreign policy. We've got to dig into some history here. Um, until the 20th century, the United States is generally guided by what we consider to be an isolationist or isolationism um, foreign policy. And this is the philosophy that we should avoid entangling alliances in, in terms of the words of George Washington um, whenever possible, right? We should avoid getting involved in conflicts. And that can be seen from this cartoon over here from World War II, right? Europe had all of these issues going on, um, you know, the Nazi agreement aggression, a lot of um, totalitarian governments springing up that are causing a lot of problems in Europe, and the United States took that isolationist approach. Then, in the 20th century, our involvement in both world wars thrust us onto the world stage. Now, in the years after World War II, the United States is generally guided by the policy of containment, the policy of keeping communism from spreading beyond the, the countries already under its influence. Um, and this policy applied to the United States during the Cold War between us and the Soviet Union, where we were competing for world power, right? Our job or idea was to contain, prevent that spread of communism from uh, the West, particularly Europe. So as you can see in this cartoon, this shows the policy of containment. The doctor, the fixer, is trying to beat communism and the chaos it brings from draining down or raining down, I should say, on Western Europe. Now, with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, containment no longer made sense. So in the past 10 years, um, we've really been redefining our foreign policy. Um, you know, we've been active participants in many international organizations like the United Nations, but generally we disagree on just how much world involvement is appropriate. And then with 9-11 and the attacks on the World Trade uh, Center and the Pentagon, we found ourselves spearheading an international war on terror or war on terrorism. And this brings up some old questions with a very different set of circumstances, right? How actively should we fight terror? What, if any, are the limits? And in 2003, we saw that there was a decision to invade Iraq to remove Saddam Hussein from power, um, and that was controversial, right? Bush using this policy of preemption, right? So maybe that's our new foreign policy, preemption to justify the war in Iraq, um, this idea of attacking before being attacked. Um, you know, we're really seeing uh, and redefining what it means to be this world power today. Now, goals of foreign policy are uh, numerous, as you can see here up on the board, but ultimately foreign policy is headed by the Department of State, one of those cabinet positions, and they're responsible for the safety of our nation, um, protecting national security, providing international leadership and developing world peace, ensuring a balance of power, keeping aggressive nations from overpowering weaker ones cooperating with other nations in solving international problems, promoting human rights and democratic values, fostering cooperative foreign trade and globalization of trade through international organizations. So as you can see, right, these are very numerous, and these goals are both national and international in nature. Um, ultimately, the 2001 attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon do confirm the fact that national and international interests are not so easily separated anymore. So how is foreign policy made? The main objective of foreign policy is diplomacy conferences, and we've talked about that word diplomacy before. But ultimately, um, these diplomacy conferences, these meetings to solve international problems are trying to keep problems from developing into conflicts that require military settlements. So this would be the president acting as their role of chief diplomat. So ultimately, who's involved in making foreign policy are first and foremost, the president. The president is the leader in foreign policy almost, um, and 
presidents, their representatives, meet with world leaders in other countries to try to peacefully solve those international problems, um, right? According to the Constitution, presidents sign treaties with the advice and consent of the Senate, of course. Um, and so the Senate, to the lesser extent, uh, also the House of Representatives, also participate in foreign policy in that regard. Um, also, the president, as we've talked about, can make those executive agreements where they can bypass the advice and consent of the Senate. They can make these with other heads of state that don't require Senate approval. The Secretary of State is also involved in foreign policy. As the head of the State Department, they are the chief coordinator of all governmental actions that affect relations with other countries. Um, the State Department also includes the Foreign Service, that includes ambassadors um, to other, to, to more than, I should say, 160 countries. These ambassadors and their staffs set up embassies in the countries and serve as the major American presence in their assigned country. Um, and their job is to protect Americans abroad and responsible for harmonious relationships with other countries. The National Security Council, as a part of the executive office of the president, is also a part of making foreign policy. Um, this council helps the president deal with foreign, military, and economic policies that affect national security. Its members are the president, the vice president, the secretary of state, and the secretary of defense, and any others that the president designs. Um, this national security advisor coordinates the council itself and often has as much influence as the Secretary of State, depending on, of course, their relationship with the president. And then finally, we have the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, and this is one of the most famous of all government agencies. It gathers, analyzes, and transmit in transmits information from other countries that ultimately might be important to the security of the nation. Um, although the CIA is best known for its participation, you know, like spies and cases that are top secret, much of that work is actually public and routine. Um, and just like so many of these agencies we've seen, the director of the CIA is appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. So um, now we're going to move on quickly here to military policy um, and just some basics of the military policy here in the United States. Um, until 1947, the cabinet level official most directly responsible for military policy was called the Secretary of War. Um, but that name has since been changed to the Secretary of Defense. Uh, or the Department of Defense. And, and the department that this official heads has more federal employees than any other in the federal government. The Department of Defense is headquartered in the Pentagon, which you see here, where about 25,000 military and civilian personnel work. Um, and this Secretary of Defense um, ultimately supervises three large military departments, which are the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force. Now, our military policy obviously is spearheaded by the president as the commander in chief of the armed forces. And the president has used this authority given to them by the constitution um, to order military forces into combat on many occasions. Um, during peacetime, um, his most important military powers are those he exercises through the Secretary of Defense in managing that department. Um, the President and Secretary of Defense make important decisions regarding the military budget and the distribution of funds among military services. So as you can see here, this is the proposed budget for 2020 in that discretionary spending um, where that money can be shifted around. And as you can see, President Trump and the Secretary of Defense have proposed 700 118 billion dollars or 57 percent of the discretionary budget um, to be spent toward defense. Now the most important military advisory body to the Secretary of Defense is the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, this, five, this has five members and they are the Chiefs of Staff of the three military departments the uh, commandant of the Marines, and a chair. And all of these service chiefs are appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. Um, however, only the Secretary of Defense sits on the President's Cabinet and on the National Security Council. So before we wrap up, we have a couple of summary questions that we are going to talk about in class, so please make sure to answer these on your notes. And we're looking at how has the U.S.'s role in foreign policy changed over time, and what role do you think the U.S. should play today in foreign policy, based on what we've talked about? And of course, explain why, um, give me a reason.
right? So I look forward to hearing your thoughts in class. Um, thank you guys for watching and sticking through the Unit 7 video notes, and I will see you guys in class. Bye!